new insurance agents out there, I'm going to tell you that the most important thing that you can learn about your presentations are these 10 questions that I'm about to go over. So the first one I'm going to go over has to do when you are talking to the client about establishing the need. So we are on the phone with a prospect or we are in front of our prospect and we're asking them what they need the insurance for. Now there's a way to do this. You can go out and ask, Hey, what do you need this insurance for? But there is, there are other ways to get them to tell you what they need it for and why they want it. Cause there's usually always going to be a couple answers to this. Okay. So what I like to ask is this say, Betty, can you walk me through what tomorrow would look like for Johnny? If you went to bed tonight and didn't wake up tomorrow. So Betty's the prospect. Johnny is her son, the beneficiary. And they may say, huh? Say Betty, if you died in your sleep tonight, or if you, if you died today, you died tomorrow morning. If you died at any time, what would Johnny's day look like the day that you die? And then just don't say anything. Wait until they answer the question. Now, nine times out of 10, they're going to say, wow, I'm not sure. It would be tough, right? This is after obviously you've established, hey, they want it to cover their funeral or cremation. Okay. So say, so you say, wow, I don't know. That would be tough. It would be tough for him. Say, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And when he goes to the funeral home and the funeral director says, okay, Johnny, I, I, look, man, I'm really, really sorry for your loss. First off. Second, Let's just get right to the chase. How are you paying for this? Betty, what would Johnny's response be? Does Johnny have the money saved up for it? Now, this could go either way. She could say yes. Then say, okay. But as a mother, you'd want to make sure he wouldn't have to come out of pocket for this. Johnny, very wealthy. More than likely, they're going to say no. Because if the parents are in a tough spot financially, the children probably are too. You don't meet many parents who are struggling for money when their kids are loaded. Okay, so you can just assume statistically 90% of people would have trouble coming out of pocket to pay for a full funeral service. Now, Benny, when he sits down with the funeral director that day and he tells Johnny, I'm sorry for your loss, but how are you paying for this? What would his response be? Now, they're probably going to say something like, I don't know, he doesn't have the money. And say, okay, well, that makes sense then that as a mother, you want to make sure that this is taken care of then. Right. So when you pass, he doesn't have to deal with that. That's going to be a lot like and it's going to happen someday. You want to make sure it's taken care of. Right. And you want to get her to say yes. Okay. Now, once she says yes, you can dig in a little bit farther and say, okay, so why is this important to you now? Right. Has, has something happened? Did you ever have to deal with this before? And you can take this question further and have her paint the picture of exactly what it's going to look like. What else would you want him to be able to do with the money for this? So you can really, did you ever have to deal with this yourself? You ever struggle with dealing with this? So the question really starts off with this. The leading question this is question number one. Betty, if you went to sleep tonight and didn't wake up tomorrow, hey, what would Johnny's day look, look like for, for him tomorrow? And it gets a lot of emotions going. And this is a really big way for to bring that pain to the surface so that she's more likely to make a decision and understand, hey, I should have done this six months ago. Because remember, you're not looking out for Betty. You're looking out for Johnny. You're looking out for the beneficiary guys in life insurance sales. If you put yourself in the shoes of the beneficiary, there's no objection that someone can come up with that you can't overcome unless it's like, I don't have the money for it. And they really don't because we deal with seniors who are on low income. So that's a very, very powerful question. Ask that in your fact finding. If you're selling bigger life insurance policies, you could say, hey, say you're selling mortgage protection. Say, hey, John, you say John's the breadwinner and his wife is, you know, takes care of the kids at home or his wife's the breadwinner and he takes the kids at home or whatever. John, if we'll assume the latter, if your wife went to bed tonight, okay, uh, and she didn't wake up tomorrow, what would you do for your next mortgage payment? What would you do for the mortgage payments for the next 10 years, 20 years? Okay. So these are questions that you want to ask people or, hey, if you're talking to the wife, hey, if you went to bed tonight, didn't wake up tomorrow, what would John do for the mortgage payments for the next 20 years, 30 years? So a very, very powerful question that you can ask someone that brings out that pain point and it gets them to really understand that it's important that they're like, crap, I should have done this six months ago. What was I waiting for? All right. Next one. What we're going into is when someone doesn't says that they don't have a checkbook or a bank statement on them. Say, uh, this is, this is one I found works many times. So you say, Hey, do you have a bank statement? You say no. Okay. Now yeah, you, oh, you have that little piece of paper that the bank sends you every month that shows you what you spent your money on. Right. And I've gotten a lot of people to be like, Oh yeah, yeah, I have that which is a bank statement. Okay. Or they're like, I can't find my checkbook. I don't have a check anywhere. Okay. Well, if you did have your account information written down somewhere or in a checkbook or a bank statement or something like that, where would you have it? If you did have it, where would you have it? And I say, you know, I, I got that stack of papers on my kitchen table. That's about 10 inches tall. Where's your stack? So asking these questions can help them think of it in a different way. A lot of times they could just be lying to you too. It's because they don't, they don't trust you at that point. So another one, third question here, 
we want to, we to establish a decision maker because when you're selling insurance, you want to make sure that you're talking to the person who can make the decision. Okay. If you sell face to face that you want the husband and the wife to be there at the same time. If you sell over the phone, I would sometimes consider not even presenting to husband and wife if they're by themselves, because one, you have a chance to sell two policies and two, the chances of a cancellation are much higher. Some people will not present to a husband or wife without the other there. Some people will and try to make the close. So whatever you want to do, but I found a good question to establish who the decision maker is and really get a tie down that that person can make a decision is the following question I'm about to go with you here. So Betty, say her husband's name is uh, James and she's getting it for her. Well, same thing. We'll say Johnny is the son, the beneficiary and Betty is her name. It's like this. Betty, does John know that you are looking into a program for him right now? Most she could say yes or she can say no. Say, okay, either way, say, okay. And do we have to get him on the phone before you'd be able to make a decision on something like this? She may say, if she says yes, try to get him on the phone right there. If not, set up a time for them to both talk or you can say, look, since it's hard to get in touch with him, I know that you want to make sure as a mom that you're taking care of him. Would it make more sense for you to just get a plan and then kind of show it to him? Because even if he said, mom, don't worry about it, you probably still want to make sure he's taken care of anyway, right? So this can help tie them down if they say that the decision maker is not there. But now what you can ask is, does Johnny pay your bills? Because if Johnny pays her bills, you can't really do anything. Johnny writes the checks. Johnny pays the bills. He has the full control over it. So assuming she says, no, I don't have to have him here. Say, okay, so John trusts you with your decisions on this is what you're saying then, right? Yes. Okay. So you can make decisions on insurance fully independent of your son. And the, the, the plan was to get something. And then when you pass, whether he knew about it or not, you'd have money there. At some point, you're going to tell him about it, but you wanted to do this for him right? Yes. Okay, cool. So you want to get these questions to tie them down. So I assume, so he trusts your, de your decision in this is, is what you're saying, right? Yes. Okay, cool. So you want to ask a few different ways. You want to make sure that they can make decisions on their own. And then you want to make sure they can make financial decisions on their own, because sometimes they'll say they make decisions on their own, but then you get to the end and they say, oh yeah, um, he pays my bills. So you can ask both those questions and you can ask this in the beginning of your presentation and also towards the end. The decision maker has to be there, set up a callback, get the decision maker on your phone. On the phone, you don't want to make one leg presentations to people. I'm the type of salesperson who tries to shoot for it no matter what. Like I will just, I always swing the bat no matter what. So I'm going to go and quote her and try to close her. That's just how I am. But could I be more efficient not doing that? Yes. There are situations where it would have made more sense for me to just hang up and call back because I go to close and then I end up calling back anyway to talk to the decision maker. So next question here is after someone gives you pushback in the close, question number four, okay, this is going to help you close more deals after you get an objection at the end. By the way, if you're finding value in this, look, subscribe to my channel, turn on post notifications. Do you think this is good? I got plenty of other videos in there that are going to help you make a ton of money selling life insurance over the phone, final expense over the phone. If you have any questions, email me at jve at thejve.com. If you want a copy of my script, email me jve at thejve.com. So the next question that we're going to get into is if someone gives you pushback in when you go for the close, you give someone a quote with some rates and you say, which of these is best for you? Which of these best fit your needs? Which of these do you want to leave for Johnny? There's no magic words that you'd say there. And they could say, oh, I got to think about it. Okay. Or I got to talk to my son. I got to talk to my husband. I got to talk to my daughter. I got to do whatever the objection is. Say right away. Say, hey, I hear what you're saying. Well, let me ask you a question, right? Does the idea make sense to you? You like the idea of, insur of an insurance program like this? And they say, yes. You say, yeah, awesome. It's an amazing program. Cover a couple features of it. Okay. It does this. It does this. That's how it's going to solve your problem. It's an awesome program. Now, let me ask you another question. If I was whoever the beneficiary is, if I was Johnny, or if they said they had to talk to someone else, if I was that person, then you'd be like, okay, let's let's figure something out and move forward. You'd move forward with it today, I'm assuming. If I was that person saying, hey, mom, I need you to do this, you'd want to get a program in place right now. At least you'd apply. Am I right? 90% of the time, they're going to say yes. And what's that mean? It's a trust thing. So it means they don't really trust you as much as they trust that other person. So when they say that, you say, hey, I hear what you're saying, right? And I, I totally understand. I don't have a track record with you. So let me introduce myself. And then you go through, you explain who you are. You explain how you're going to help them. You explain what you stand for. Maybe you have a family. Maybe you went through a tough funeral decision before, or maybe you had to come up with the funds before. Explain, hey, maybe you had a tragic situation with a client who got a policy and you, it really, really helped them. So use some real stories. Say, hey, this is who I am. This is what I stand for. And this is what our company stands for. It's essentially what you're going to explain right there. And then what you do is you recommend for them to go with a lower amount of coverage and under the presumption that they can increase in the future. Next question here, this is huge. So you're gonna get this when you call someone to set an appointment or make a sale. They're gonna tell you, I have insurance already. 
They're going to tell you, I'm not interested. Great question to ask is, hey, I know that's right, but when you were interested, what were you interested in? This usually gets people to start talking and get a conversation mustered up. Okay, so I'm not interested. Hey, I know that's right, but let me ask you this. When you were interested, what were you interested in? That way you can get them talking and you can just expand on that from there. It usually gets a conversation. It gets the communication flowing. You say, look, my job is just to get you all this information in the shortest amount of time possible and you can make a decision whenever you're ready. And then you can just keep going with it after you have that conversation with them. Quick little chat. Next, this question is what you're going to want to ask as you're going through your presentation before you go for the close. Okay. Before you ask for the money. Okay. You say, Hey, look now, if I'm assuming that I know you want me to help you make sure that when you pass beneficiary has the money that they need in place to take care of your final arrangement, right? So then uh, it makes sense then for you to apply for something today to see if you can get approved to cover that. If we are able to find something that fits your budget, right? Make that you, that you can afford every month, right? Yes, cool. So first you do a pre-qualifying question, say, now I know I'm assuming you want me to help you find a program that will cover these things for this person to help them out when you pass, right? Yes, cool. That's why we're on the phone. So I'm assuming if we find something today that you can afford, you'd want me to help you apply for it, right? So it really locks them in that, that hey, they're giving you that pre-commitment. It's called a trial close. You're testing the water there. You ask this before your actual close when you go for when you give them the rates or during your presentation you can ask that too question number seven this is important to ask when you are on the phone or in someone's home and you want to do a policy review so you're going to run, going to run into situations where they have a common competitor and you're going to want to make a comparison with what you have or what you have to offer and what they say that they have or they think they have so especially on the phone you're going to call the insurance company if they don't have the and if you're face to face if they don't have a policy there you got to call the insurance company so you're going to get people who are going to say no i don't want to do that they're going to give you pushback so i found a great question that i like to ask them is this now i i hear you, you know it's private information and i get it you don't know me but who would you rather be right? Okay. Cause I've seen some people have policies that are exactly what they say they are, which is exactly what I'm hoping yours is. But I've also seen people say they have policies that are a certain thing. And then we call and come to find out it really wasn't. And, and that's not my fault. That's not really anybody's fault. That's that there's may have been some miscommunication and misunderstanding when the policy was taken out. So who would you rather be right? Would you rather have us call and you be right that you have exactly what you have? Or would you rather have us not call in 15, 20, 30 years down the road when you pass away, I end up being right. And it may have been, so, it, there may have been something in that policy that you didn't fully understand. Who would you rather be right? They're, they're going to say me. I'd rather have me be right. You say, okay, cool. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to give them a call. I know some people at the back office over there. It's going to take a few minutes. We're just going to ask some basic information. And if you have something that far superior to anything that I have to offer you, I would never expect you to make that change. It's unethical and I could lose my license for it. I'm not in the business of doing that. So let's give them a call. All it's going to do is help you. And hey, worst case, you did an extra policy review this year. Get that other company on the phone. Okay. So you want to ask them, who would you rather be right? Would you rather have, have you be right and us call and everything's exactly as, as it is. Would you rather have me be right? And I'm going to the assumption that a lot of time there's things that people may not completely understand about the policy because there is that complicated insurance mumbo jumbo lingo. So who would you rather be right? People always want to say that they want to be right. This next one, number eight is how you close people when they keep pushing back. Okay. So if they keep pushing back and it's a, and you can't get them to close your hit, hit rebuttal, 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 rebuttal. And they keep hitting you with some objections. You say, okay, look, so why don't you do this? I know this is important to you. So why don't you do this? Why don't you enroll, give them the absolute lowest that you can qualify them for, or like a super low amount that is, that makes it like somewhat worth it right? Make it like a really low amount. Be like, why don't you do this? Enroll in the lowest amount, essentially that you think in their head makes sense. So like enroll in the $5,000 program right now. It's only this much a month. Enroll in this program right now. And at any time in the future, we can always do another policy and increase it. You know, you can finally start checking this off your list because at least at the bare minimum, you're going to want to have this much in place. This is a stepping stone. We don't have to go for the full field goal today or the full touchdown today. We can kick a field goal, get some points on the board and make sure you're one step closer to winning the game. Sound fair enough? I use that football close all the time. I, I made that up. <laughs> so I say, look, sometimes we go for a touchdown. Sometimes we go for a field goal. What we're going to do, we're going to enroll in this amount today. Let's do this. Let's just, let's enroll with this one. Start with this, get some points on the board. The teams that all that go for field goals and touchdowns always win versus the ones who always go for touchdowns. So let's go for a field goal today. We can score a touchdown later. At least we know we get some points, points on the board. We'll start with this program. It's only this much a month. You can set the first payment for whenever it fits best for you. Sound fair enough? And at the end, that close works a lot of times. Now you can use, use that as kind of like a last resort close. 
okay, to go for the bare minimum that you're trying to get them to do, at least get them to apply. Then you can upsell them. You can call them again, upsell them. You can always sell someone another policy. That's the thing. When you sell someone in life insurance, some agents just have this like such short term approach where they're like, I got to get them right now, right now, as much as they can afford. Doesn't, I'd rather have two $50 a month policies than one $100 a month policy personally, because if they cancel the hundred dollars, there goes my, all my renewal. They cancel one $50 a month policy and a chargeback. They cancel one $50 a month policy. It's not the same chargeback. And I still have some renewals that I have coming in. Okay. So that's what you use as a, as a last resort close to lower, absolutely drop bare minimum application just to get the app in, get that family protected. Last question here. When you're running into people who are talking about finances, okay, so question number 10, all these questions are going to help you make more money. They help me make money. Question number 10, you're going to run into some people who say that they don't have much money. You're going to run into people who are saying they can't afford what you're selling them. It's inevitable, especially if you're selling final expense, maybe even sell mortgage protection or other life insurance products or whatever insurance you're selling. doesn't matter. We're going to run into people who said they can't afford the products. So what you do is you take the bare minimum that people can usually spend on like a lowest amount and you ask them if they can afford that. But you ask them this way. So you say, hey, look, Betty, now, if we were able to get these problems solved for you, right? Say I was able to, you, you want this for your funeral, right? You said you want a funeral or a cremation, whatever. So if, if I was able to solve a large portion of that, if not all of that problem for at, at the very least 40 bucks a month, because that's usually the absolute lowest that the programs are priced out at. $40 is like the starting point. Would $40 a month take food off your table right now? Is, is 40 bucks something that would be very, very hard for you to make? as a payment consistently, if not right now. If you did hypothetically get a program that was exactly as you wanted it, would that be tough? So I like to ask that, right? how much can you afford every month? People, like how much do you want to spend? I mean, I don't want to spend anything. I can't afford anything. So people, if people bring up the money issue and you, you, you get a sense that it's a money thing, oh, I'm really struggling, times are tough. Say, okay, look, I could solve all these problems and I could get you a program that would do exactly what you wanted it to do for your family. And at a bare minimum, it costs 40 bucks a month. Would that take food off your table? And if they say, yes, it would, move on with the client follow up with them. They say, no, it wouldn't then proceed with your presentation. Hey, you guys, I hope you like these questions. Please apply these. If you're a new insurance agent, these questions are going to make you money. I've learned these questions and honed them in over time. It's in your presentation, in your clothes, when you're calling people. So there are a ton of different questions that you can use to help you make more money selling life insurance, especially over the phone. So please use these questions, apply them. If you have any questions for me, email me jve at the jve.com. And if you check out this video right here, you do not want to miss the next video. There are some monster tips for insurance agents in this next video. They're going to help you make $100,000. Please, please watch that video. It's super important you do. It's a great follow-up to this one. Thank you.